Jesus Christ superstar, and much more. He was a friend of politicians and even royalty. Uh, Harry earned his name as the biggest entrepreneur in Australia. Uh, then came the Compute Tickets disaster, the court cases, and suddenly Harry M. Miller was a golden boy no longer, and a jail term followed. Uh, pretty heavy stuff for a guy who's gone from a white collar worker, very successful, into the dregs of uh, going to prison. Harry M. Miller is with us tonight. He probably has a story to tell and a few things to answer. So would you please welcome him, Harry M. Miller, here. <laughs> Welcome out. It's a bit late, but welcome out, as they say. Is that, is that what they say to you? I don't know what they say anymore. Tell me something. Um, I had a chance to browse through the book. Most of it's biographical. The last two chapters really deal with what would virtually be the last two chapters of your life. Why did you write this, uh, uh, this book? Well, it started about 10 years ago. And um, a man that I collaborated with for years, Dennis O'Brien, hmm. um, we started to get the book together. And about three years ago, uh, the Macmillan Company asked us if, if I'd finally do the book. So I said yes. So we started work. And uh, finally, we ended up with a couple of chapters. Didn't plan it, actually, that there were a couple of extra chapters in it. It was just going to be a biography. You yeah, mean, it was just a biography about, yeah. you know, from starting out in New Zealand and all through those quite incredible days in the theatre and what yeah. really happened in the Royal Muse and what the horses really did when I tried to get the good coach and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and the sad thing that happened right here in Melbourne with Judy Garland and all those things. And then came the CompuTicket crash and then came a quite bloody dreadful period um, in jail. And that's when I finished the book. I said at the end, uh, it's time to go back to work. Mm. Harry, there's many pros and cons about CompuTicket, okay? So I really don't even want to enter it because I think the, at least according to what I've read in there, the ins and an out and the whys and the wherefores of CompuTicket is quite confusing to a layman like myself. There's a lot of uh, political things in there. There's a lot of uh, legal wrangling going on with everybody. But let's talk about prison. I mean, that's got to be the biggest cultural shock of anyone's life, to be removed from your everyday way of life, from a successful career, and, and thrown in there. So, yeah, there, there were some things that didn't worry me at all. Um, as I say in the book, I ran away to sea when I was, you know, mm. 17. So being in a small room didn't worry me. In fact, because it wasn't at sea and I wasn't being ill all the time, it was you know, a bit of a relief. Um, uh, I went to boarding school for 10 or 12 years. And at boarding school in, the, in New Zealand, they give out prizes for bad food every year. So <laughs> jail food wasn't a problem. Mm. What, what appalled me, um, and it would appall most people who are watching this program, people in the audience, was that... Um, I, I couldn't believe what I saw. Um, on the first day that I was incarcerated, um, I saw two young guys shooting heroin into their arms in, a, in an open lavatory, in an open yard. Mm. Uh, my mouth just flew open. And I, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that put hair on. So at a time when people thought that grass was something that you mowed on a Saturday morning. Right. You've changed uh, your attitudes on grass because of that too. Well, of course, and, and I, I was just appalled. <laughs> Um, what happened uh, was that I, I looked at these kids and over that 10 months I talked to lots of these young kids and there are parents here and watching the show who probably think their kids are at a drive-in movie tonight but in fact they're out robbing, stealing, maybe with guns to get some more money, more than they need in their job uh, to f handle their drug habit. And I, I just think that it's a real worry. And one of the things that I was concerned about in that quite awful time was that I never heard anybody really talk about human beings. I never heard anybody talk about families. I never heard anybody talk about dignity or rehabilitation. And the system's no good, you know? Most young kids today know it. Um, if the system worked, people wouldn't keep going back to jail. And I know that, uh, from my point of view, and I'm very right-wing politically, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm even to the right of Joe because I'm from the rural rum, but when I when I think about these young kids, I worry because if I, I think now that there's no doubt in my mind that I would decriminalise marijuana in this country, in fact everywhere in the world, because it's that track that leads it's to It's that starting drugs. point and when it's not there they you move know, on to something else. What you there mean. are a lot of people who, who, yeah. who smoke grass who don't go on to hard drugs, but I never met anybody that was on heroin, that was an addict in jail, mm. um, that didn't start with grass and some dealer didn't say, haven't got any grass today, mate. 
Mm. Just try this, no extra cost. And that's the way it starts. And I think that if we didn't have that, we'd, we'd be better people. What about the, uh, the uh, there is a, a course, uh, the rampant homosexuality, which they always talk about in prison. And in some cases, I saw an interview years ago where they talked about uh, a, uh, a fellow said, hey, uh, help me, I'm being pack raped. And the guard said, forget about it, it's inevitable. I'm not saying any of that towards you, that's not what I mean, but wouldn't there be a fear in a, in a heterosexual mind like yourself that you, you, you run into this place and suddenly that could even be violated by a group of guys who decided that they wanted to do it with no protection from waters or anything? Jeez, I've never been attractive to guys, you know. Don't I work well, you don't have to be attractive for them to grab you. Right? I don't well, think they care much what you look like I if they're going to grab you. I've no? never had a decent offer, uh, ever. But, um, uh, no, I... Uh, I, of course it happens, but there are gay people everywhere in the world, and, and there are, you know, bullies who rape women or men. I mean, those bullies exist everywhere, and I, I don't think that's... Uh, well, move off of that for a minute, then. Let's go with the bullies. Are there, is, it, is it like another society inside there? Are there guys who hold the power uh, more so than others, who oh, dictate right. what, how the jail works? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, I had a nasty period when I was... Um, when they sort of grabbed me and locked me up in a, in a maximum security jail over... a a supposed, you know, printing episode, and um, that was the with the bull sales, with the bull poster, you with know? the bull posters, yeah, right, um, yeah. and that was um, it was just a scam, you know, and uh, I mean, I was accused of a scam on your part or a scam on them well, reporting. I a scam on their part. I mean, there was a shock horror thing in the <coughs> paper, and um, there was a situation where I was accused of um, using illegally jail printing presses and all that stuff, and uh, you can't fight, you know, you can't argue, and as it's turned out now. Um, the jail uh, made a written, a printed quote, wrote out a manufacturing order, five copies to print the posters at a special price, and then one of the warders tore all the pages out of the book, and I was left there, like holding the, the poster, I suppose, um, and uh, pretty spooky. And when I went to that maximum security thing for six weeks. Uh, I couldn't believe what was happening. I just couldn't believe my eyes. Well, who moved you to maximum security? All through the course of this book, you keep sort of hinting, Harry, that there's somebody out to get you in there that was not allowing you to have the basics. Now, certainly you shouldn't have been sent to maximum security for what you did, but well, yet you weren't left there. Yeah, I was really left there, and I... Well, I who went, was out to get you like God that? God knows. We have, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but it was pretty spooky. And it's only now where the warder was charged, and he said in court, um, I, I panicked. You know, I tore the pages out of the book, blah, blah, blah. I kept saying pages out of the book. No, believe me. Uh, and uh, it's only this year, you know, that I've been able to um, have a bull poster, which I just happen to have with me. <laughs> is this this year's bull sales? This is this year's. Well, this one's legitimate, folks. It was printed on our Channel 9 printing press. Six Dunmore Manila Cemental <laughs> Pure Red Bulls. So you're Gary, You come on national television and plug your damn bulls again. Oh, well. <laughs> But, you know, I guess you and bulls are closely associated. One, yeah, of, one, of, one of the real problems, what I'd like to see happen is I'd like to see uh, people uh, have a good look at their kids. I'd like to see us start with young kids a bit earlier, you know. I, I was once doing an application for a young boy, 20, and... Um, is he in prison, you mean? Yep. Yeah. And I looked at this kid, and I was talking to him about getting a job, you know. And the more I talked to him, the more I realised that he couldn't earn enough money no matter what he did. He was a hearing addict. And I thought maybe get a job as a brain surgeon or a, a lawyer. They make a lot of money. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but I suddenly looked at him and I said, look, it, it wouldn't matter if you earned two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, because that isn't enough. Mm. And he looked at me and I, and I said, unless you can throw your hair and habit, you're buggered, son, aren't you? And he looked at me and a tear came into the eye and he agreed that he was. And here was a young boy who, because he's an addict, is gone forever. He's doomed to be an armed robber. That's pretty spooky, Don. Yeah, well, you put the jail and you're an addict, there's no way out of it. You know? yeah. How did you handle it emotionally yourself? In the book, you say you cried a lot the first week or so that you were there. I mean, like, oh, when, no, when the no. shock finally hit no, you. I'm what? not saying there's anything weak in that. I oh, mean, you know. I can assure you there's not. No, I, I was... I think poor. everybody, by the way, should go to jail once and see what it's like, and yeah. there'd be a lot better people around, I'll tell you now. Uh, <laughs> now, what, now, what I... What I, I think, went. Well, <laughs> yeah, sure. What I think happens for all of us, I, I didn't disintegrate until they locked me up in a maximum security jail. And they, they really locked me up for six weeks, 17 and a half hours a day. And I cried till I had nothing left. I mean, I was dry inside. I really didn't think I'd make it. And through, and I mean this, through uh, the support of people in the industry, you know, Graham, Bert, all the people I know, writing letters, my family, people that cared about me, kept saying, don't 
collapse, and I really thought I, I would, but I finally pulled through, but it was horrendous. And I mean, to be offered exercise when you've got one set of clothes and it's raining in a yard with a cage over it, that's a bit crazy, you know, mm. all that sort of stuff. So, you know, but finally, uh, as I describe it in the book, it's the kind of experience you almost wouldn't want to miss. Mm. Because now you look around and you think, gee, I'm, you know, I'm up and, and I'm about and I'm working. Uh, I can maybe help some more people, put, make some films, do some more things. And um, it makes you, you've got to make you a different person, not harder, but just more understanding. Well, harder, harder is a, a, a good operative word here, Harry. You, you said in the book, uh, you reached the point after a while where you absolutely had no fear anymore yeah. of things. Whereas you were really frightened when you first went in, you suddenly reach yeah. a turning point where you say, look, I'm just not afraid of any of this anymore. Yeah, what happened What happened in that dreadful incarceration, um, where they really locked me up, I, when I did pack up, I, one morning, a couple of weeks later, was shaving and I looked in the mirror and I looked at my face and there was something missing. And what I realised I'd done, that in putting myself back together again, I hadn't p picked up the bit that had fear written on it. And I looked at my eyes and I couldn't believe that I just wasn't frightened anymore of anything. I don't think I ever will be now till the day I die. Mm. Not that makes, it doesn't make you bolder or cheeky, it just makes you not frightened. And what's the future hold now, huh? The future, well... You're going to do... You, I heard you say on 60 40. Minutes you were going to do a computer ticket again. Are you going well, to do a computer well, ticket again? people have asked me. You know, it was a long time ago and what people now realise was what I really saw. Um, people... You know, young kids now look at computer and say, yeah, we know about that, but that's only two years. Young kids have been working computers and all that. Yeah. So we've had a lot of pressure from people who were slow going on, who said, look, we, we feel it ought to happen again. We now know what you meant. Mm. And maybe uh, next year um, or the year after, we will do it again. A couple of priorities to fill in first. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, we, but I think we might because it was, it was the best idea I ever had in my whole life, mm -hmm. the very best. Well... Uh, Wherever direction it goes in, I'm sure you're going to be hearing a lot more of Harry M. Miller. He's a guy you can't really keep out of the news. Uh, this is his story. That's the book, My Story by Harry M. Miller. If you want to hear it out of a horse's mouth, you get a chance to see it for yourself. Thank him for coming in. Harry M. Miller.